I'm Lori Weiner, one of the Children's Inn founders, past board member, board president, and now trustee of the Children's Inn at NIH. Due to a last minute change, Jenny Luca, the Inn CEO, is unable to join us this evening. Tonight, we would like to welcome you to a celebration of one of the Inn's most dedicated supporters, Cokie Roberts. Joining me is author and journalist, Steve Roberts, who'll be sharing stories about Cokie his wife of 53 years. We will also be joined by NPR legal affairs correspondent and one of Koki's longtime friends, Nina Totenberg. But before we start, I wanted to take a moment to honor Koki and to tell you how she provided comfort and joy to our families. Koki was a beloved Children's Inn board member and committed advocate for the Inn for nearly three decades. She was guided by her passion for both helping seriously ill children and in clinical research at the National Institutes of Health. In the words of Koki, the people who are the heroes of the story are the children. Koki was a trailblazer, a humanitarian, a pioneering storyteller, a believer, and an inspiration to us all. She is hope personified. In Steve's book, there, is, there are so many stories that exemplified Koki's passion and spirit. At the Children's Inn, we have a few Koki stories of our own. My family and I have run the Children's Inn every Christmas Eve and Christmas Day since the Inn opened in 1990. And one year when carolers were unable to sing to Inn families on Christmas Eve, Koki and her daughter Becca and several grandchildren filled our halls with holiday tunes and cookies. And when volunteers were needed to help the inn install new playground equipment, Koki rolled up her sleeves, grabbed a shovel, and dug in. Koki attended every event she could and emceed our congressional galas and receptions over the years. Koki Roberts was truly a face of hope. Today at the inn, her memory, her generosity, and her commitment lives on. Steve and Nina, thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm gonna to turn this over to you, but perhaps even just starting, but seeing all of these photos of Koki at the inn, I'm sure it was beautiful and challenging, but it leads me to ask, what was your inspiration for then writing this book now? Well, Laurie, thank you so much. And um, you, you're right, Koki's devotion to the inn was limitless. Uh, she That's loved the inn. And um, husband. Uh, if you, by the way, if you're on this call, please mute. <laughs> um, uh, Koki's um, uh, devotion to the end was, was limitless. And uh, uh, I remember one day when uh, uh, ABC was bought by Disney, Laurie, and um, as, as part of the uh, uh, of their gesture to their stars, they sent everyone a life-size uh, stuffed version of Mickey Mouse. <laughs> it was six feet tall. And Coach said, what am I gonna do with this? And we looked at each other and said, we know we're gonna bring it to the children's inn. And so <laughs> we brought this six foot tall, tall um, version of Mickey Mouse. I remember carrying it. I remember I could barely carry it, carrying it into the, uh, into the inn. And, for years, we were told, uh, children would curl up inside Mickey's, Mickey's arms. And uh, it was only one of the many ways in which uh, Koki's generosity of spirit um, uh, touched the inn. And, I remember seeing it. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and look, to answer your question, um, after she died, I um, gave a eulogy at the St. Matthew's Cathedral. There were a thousand people there and many others watched on television. And I just told stories about her life, Lori. And um, she and I, over many, many years, said to each other, this is how people learn. They learn through stories. They don't learn through sermons and speeches. They learn through stories. And people just said, I want to hear more cokey stories. And, 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 you know, in the end, a big part of this book is, is not the public cokey, it's the private cokey. Um, she was an enormous inspiration to women and girls for generations. There were, I heard countless stories, of young women saying, I, I listened to her on the radio 
my mom strapped me into my infant seat, you know, <laughs> made me listen to NPR as like she drove me to um, nursery school and others who watched her on TV. And they, and they said, I can be that strong. I can be that smart. I can be an independent, smart woman. I don't have to hide who I am. It was a marvelous country. And if that's the only thing she had ever done, it would have been a marvelous contribution. But I wanted also to tell the stories of the private Koki. Uh, this is a woman who did something good for somebody else every single day of her life. She lived the gospel. She was a devout Catholic, um, and her faith animated her every day. Um, and I'll just tell you one, and people say to me over and over, how did she do it all? I mean, here's a woman who had several major careers, not only if she had only been on TV and only been on radio, and then she writes five best-selling books. And she's a wife of 53 years and has two children and six grandchildren who she was deeply devoted to. And she did all these things for all of her friends. And people say, well, how did she do it? And there's a woman I quote in the book named Jane Naylor. Jane was a good friend at ABC and lost her brother young. Uh, her brother died young and, and she was away from the office for several weeks and came back. And the first morning she's back, Koki appears in her office door and closes the door and says, Jane, talk to me. And Jane just collapses in grief, sobbing and, 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 and crying and, 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 and talking about her brother. And, and she finally, through her tears, says to Koki, Koki, you're the busiest woman I know. How can you, you don't have the time to be spending here listening to me. And Koki looked at her and said, Jane, right now, the most important thing I can do is be here listening to you and be your friend. And that's how she did it, because her priorities were clear. She knew that the, that was the single most important thing she could do at that moment, was be a friend to this woman. And I wanted that to come through in the book, Laurie. I wanted people to read those stories and have a sense not just of the public Koki, which they kind of know, but the private Koki, which maybe they'll learn something about. What did you learn while writing the book? listening to stories? I always knew the, how much time she spent on uh, friends, particularly her female friends. But I wasn't there, Lori, when she was in the office with Jane. I wasn't there when she helped Nina Totenberg pick out a casket for her husband after he dies. I was not there when she was in every maternity ward in the zip code when young friends of hers had babies. Um, I wasn't there when she flew to Massachusetts to stand at the side of a friend who was burying her son who had committed suicide. And so I learned these, these, these stories of, that I had never, because I wasn't there. I, I, we were married for 53 years. I knew her pretty darn well. We had written two books together, including one about marriage. And yet I learned these stories. And even I was, I was overwhelmed by them. I was overwhelmed by them. Nina can tell the story. Nina, don't you tell the story about uh, the day Koki uh, uh, helped you pick out a casket for your husband, Floyd, because this is one of my favorite stories in the whole book. She's not on? All right, well, I'll tell the story. So Nina tells the story, Laurie, about how um, her husband, Floyd, uh, had died uh, actually in a, uh, in an airplane, he was being medevaced back to Washington. And as Nina tells me the story, um, Koki did Floyd's death. And she arranged for him to be buried at Arlington. She arranged for the funeral. She just did everything. And then it came time to pick out a casket. And Koki says to Nina, well, I'm gonna come with you to pick out a casket. Now, what kind of friend? It takes a really rather special friend to say, at that moment of your deepest grief, and, and, and stress to say, I'll be at your side at that moment. So they go to the funeral home. And as Nina tells the story, this rather obsequious character is trying to sell her a more expensive casket. And he looks at her and says, well, Ms. Totenberg, your husband is a very tall man. So he'd be much more comfortable in this more expensive casket. <laughs> at which point, Koki and Nina look at each other and burst out laughing. Now, what kind of friend, what kind of friend um, not only comes 
to the funeral home to pick out a casket, but can laugh with you at that moment. Pretty special. That is a cokey moment. <laughs> yeah, she had a wicked sense of humor too. And which she, which she um, uh, focused on, often focused on men um, who she considered uh, pompous and self important, including, I must say, her husband. Um, more than, more do than tell, um, do tell a story about that. More than once. Well, I'll tell you a story. Um, at one point, um, uh, Koki um, uh, and I had written, or Koki had originally written a Haggadah, the book that, as you know, of course, is used at Passover to um, read the uh, uh, read the prayers and, and tell the story of Passover and, and describe the rituals and the symbols. And when we first got married, Koki was Catholic, I was Jewish. And so the only way she, as she said many times, the only way she could be part of my Jewish tradition was to through ritual you know she didn't have a jewish grandmother i had two of them i knew i was jewish right but she didn't and so she very and she was also as a believing catholic she was practiced in ritual much more than my family so anyway so she decides she's going to write a haggadah classic koki right and she writes this haggadah which is pretty much aimed at interfaith families and um, and we used it for years in the family. Nina was always a, uh, a regular at our Passover, still is, and um, they uh, uh, and it had it for 30 years. And at one point, the uh, folks in the Jewish book world decided, uh, came to us and said, well, you should publish this as a book. So we thought, well, that's a good idea. So um, I look at the manuscript and it's, you know, it needs some freshening, it needs some and I start editing it. And Koki was furious with me. She was furious. And she says to me, Stephen, this is sacred text. You can't change a word. Now, I did not stay married to this woman for 53 years, Lori, by ignoring those moments when her, when she was rather emphatic. Uh, yes, dear, whatever you say, dear. Then she starts changing it. And I said, Koki, you told me this was sacred text. I couldn't change a word. And she says, that's right, Stephen. I told you, you couldn't change a word. But since I wrote it, I get to change it. We came to a detente eventually on this one. But um, she, you know, Koki, you know, could be judgmental. And um, she writes in, in one of her history books, she writes about a woman named Anne Royal, who was a newspaper editor in uh, mid 19th century, who was once arrested for the crime of being a common scold. And Koki pointed out that if being a common scold was a crime today, she'd be in deep trouble. <laughs> Thank you for sharing those. It looks like Nina's been on and off and we may have lost her. So in the meantime, there's so many key moments that were in the book. Which one, what do you think was most consequential to Koki? If she was reading this book now, what part do you think would have been most consequential to her? Oh, without a doubt, um, the private stories. I mean, that was her main priority, even as she became so famous. And, and now she cared deeply about her work. Um, you know, when she often said, when she was asked, professionally, what's the thing you care most about? What you, uh, she always said the books, the history books, um, of which there were five uh, national bestsellers. You know, Laurie, when she, we got married and uh, she went to New York, we moved to New York, because of course, 1966, um, that's what you did, right? You, you uh, uh, moved for the guy's job and we moved to New York. I know you're a graduate of NYU and, and um, as my parents were, uh, and uh, and she mo we moved to New York, and uh, she went looking for a job, and these and the, uh, doors were slammed in her face, slammed in her face. She was told, "We do not hire women to be writers." Now I think after five national bestsellers, she proved them wrong about that one, but it left her quite depressed and discouraged often. Um, uh, so she doesn't, you know, the, her struggles to establish herself as a woman of that age, uh, she were very important to her. But 
in the end, really, it was it was those private acts, the day to day acts that were most important to her. And, you know, one of her friends said to me, you know, I don't want one of those uh, brace bracelets that says WWJD, what would Jesus do? I want one of those bracelets that says WWCD, what would Koki do? And the fact is, so many people having read this book say to me, they now ask themselves that question. I, I have to tell you, Steve, we asked that question is at the board meeting for years. And um, uh, when I was writing this book, Lori, my uh, younger brother who lived um, just five minutes from the inn, actually, uh, right up Rockville Pike um, in uh, Garrett Park. And he had been fading for years from Parkinson's. And uh, uh, my sister-in-law called me one day and said, I, we almost lost him last night. You better get here today if you want to see him one more time, which I did. Held his hand, kissed him goodbye. Next morning, phone rings at six o'clock in the morning. It's never good news at six o'clock in the morning. Right? We know that. And so uh, I pick up the phone. It's my sister-in-law says he died overnight. Um, and now you can go back to bed. I sat there with my phone in my hand. I said to myself, what would Koki do? And I knew. I got up. I got dressed. I'm driving to my brother's house. I call my sister and I say to her, uh, Laura, I'm driving to Glenn's house because that's what Koki would want me to do. And she said, Stephen, you have it wrong. Koki would have been there last night sleeping on the couch, right? So later in the day, later in the day, I call my son and I say to him, uh, you know, uh, Nina, we can hear you. <laughs> I've got Fern on the other line. I have to go um, now. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I'm I'm, t I'm telling the story. Of what happened? So I, my sister says, "You got it wrong, Stephen. Koki would have been at Glenn's house last night, sleeping on the couch." Later in the day, I talk to my son and I say, "Tell him the story." He said, "Dad, you're both wrong. Mom would have been there for the last three nights, sleeping on the couch." And so. That to me, is, I, I did it just the other day. I was, I was doing a book event in South Carolina. I, I had gotten in at one o'clock the night before. It was a big event. I was exhausted afterwards. But I had a good friend who was supposed to be at the lunch and couldn't come because he had had quadruple bypass and, and was too sick to get there. And left to my own devices, I would have gone home and taken a nap. And I sat there and said, what would Koki do? And I got in the car and drove to John's house and spent an hour with him. And that's, that's the most important thing in this book. That's the most important lesson in this book right there. It's not how famous she was as a broadcaster, it, even though those were terribly important things. It's those private acts. Because look, Lori, not everybody can be a famous TV star. Not everybody can be on the radio like Nina, but everybody can be a good person. Everybody can learn something from Koki's life through these, these private acts of friendship and generosity. And that's, that to me is the most important lesson of the book. It permeates through every page. Nina, welcome back. Thank you, let's hope I stay here. <laughs> the gremlins of Zoom kept knocking me off. So let's just hope for the best. I hope so. You're, you're in your, if, I, if I'm duplicating something here, just shut me up. But you're in your den at uh, your house which is a house that not only you lived in for decades and decades, but your, your in-laws lived in. So um, tell us about that. And you, and you are happily roaming around it and planning, I hope, Passover for this uh, spring, because we've missed it for the last two years, of course. But, but it's, a, it's a very special place for, for Hale and Lindy, who preceded you, it was a different kind of special place, but you should really give um, our viewers and listeners some idea of this family that you married into and how, how difficult in some ways it was in the beginning of your courtship, but how- well, this, Yeah, this house, Nina, as you point out, you've been here countless times, so you know, this is a house, it's right here on Bradley Boulevard in Bethesda. It's, five minutes from the children's end, right? And um, 
Koki's parents born in 1952. Um, her dad was a member of Congress. Um, their kids had been going to school half year in each city in New Orleans and here. They decided that wasn't a good idea. So they bought this house so that the family would move here and the kids could go full time to school in Washington. And um, so her parents lived in it for 25 years. Now, the first time I came to this house, I was 20 years old in, uh, in the summer, in, in the spring of 1963. Koki and I had met the previous summer uh, at a student political meeting. It was between our sophomore and junior years of, of, of college. Um, our dorms were 12 and a half miles apart. She was at Wellesley and I was at Harvard. And uh, we actually went out a couple of times. Um, she asked me out actually once. She was a singer, as you all know, as you are, Nina. And um, she um, had a part in the junior show at Wellesley. And so she invited me to come and I did. And of course, since I was such a lavish spender, I took her to a, a bountiful meal at the Howard Johnson's and in the center of Wellesley. Um, we didn't get off to a great start, but, um, uh, and then like an idiot, I stopped calling. I mean, I just stopped calling because I would never had a girlfriend before, serious girlfriend. And there was this huge religious difference. I was very much a Jew, she was Catholic. Everybody told us it could never work. So I stopped calling and four or five months later, um, I, uh, both of us had arranged to come to Washington for another student political meeting run by her older sister. And uh, both of us were going to come in the same car driving down from Boston. And I remember Nina approaching the car parked on a side street in Cambridge, Mount Auburn Street, which you know well. And um, I saw Koki through the back window of the car. And I said to myself, you idiot. I mean, this is the girl. What the hell have you been doing? And so I got in the car. We drove down here, came to this house for the first time. First night I ever spent in this house spring 1963. I'm ensconced in Koki's girlhood room, later our daughter's girlhood room. And I'm coughing my head off because I'm spending the, you know, the, the winter in Boston. Everybody coughs the winter in Boston. And I hear a knock on the door. Now this is 1963, so I figure it's not Koki, right? In wafts my future mother-in-law, the future nine-term member of the US Congress, the future ambassador to the Vatican, in an off the shoulder peach colored negligee and says to me, why darling, which was her universal form of address, why darling, you sound terrible, drink this. <laughs> at which point she handed me a glass that I'm sure was at least two thirds bourbon. Uh, but I have no idea because I was in shock. I mean, I had never met anybody like Lindy Boggs at Bayonne, in Bayonne, New Jersey. Believe me, I had never met anybody like this. And, <laughs> So that was my first night in this house. My first night in this house, spring 1963, 20 years old. The next night, we spent Saturday, um, spent Saturday at this political meeting, and there were at least one, if not more, young men angling to take Koki home. Um, but since I was staying here, I uh, had the inside track. And there a whole bunch of guys were supposed to stay here, and one by one, each of them had dropped out. So I was the only one left. And that night, that Saturday night, we stayed up all night talking in a room that's directly below where I'm sitting right now. And we started, that was the night that we first started seeing a way forward, a path forward that, um, and we started to realize that the stereotypes and prejudices people on both sides were trying to impose on us in terms of religion, that we could find a different way. We could find a set of values, core values that we shared and that the stereotypes and prejudice people had didn't have to control our lives and didn't have to define who we were. And really, Nina, we were together from that night, that spring of 1963. Um, took me three and a half more years to propose, as Koki said with some bitterness, I proposed by saying, oh, all right, Koki. <laughs> I, I thought that was kind of romantic. She apparently held a grudge. Uh, but. Um, so this house, we, we, we then left, we got married in the yard of this house, 1966, in the garden, right, you know, like where I'm pointing, right out that window. And it wasn't some little wedding. No, it was, you know, <laughs> 1,500 people at the wedding. But um, then we came back here 11 years later and bought the house from Koki's mother and moved in here in the fall of 1977 and raised our children here. Um, so this 
this is pretty much sacred ground. Yeah. So I have been waiting many years to ask you this question. The bedroom in which Kofi and Steve lived forever. Yes, they upgraded it when their kids were finally through college. They finally had enough expendable income that they could do some stuff to it. But it was the same bed that her parents had slept in. Now, my question is this. It is not even a queen size bed. Neither of you are tiny little people. She was taller than me by a fair amount. You're probably well over six feet or over. And how did you fit in this bed? Well, as she uh, said many times, we were crazy nuts about each other. So that made it easier. <laughs> um, uh, but as we got older and crotchety, sure, we actually, I occasionally raised the question of getting a bigger bed. And this, I might have been saying, let's sell several grandchildren into indentured servitude. I mean, if that's how uh, 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 welcoming this suggestion was. I mean, I mentioned that, you know, the, the, the text of the Haggadah was sacred text. This house is sacred space. The bed was sacred too. I mean, Koki was a, a woman of ritual. You know this, Nina. She was a that's woman of deep funny. loyalties and she was loyal to you know certain basic things, and and this bed, it's an actually it's a beautiful bed. As you know, it's it's, it's cherry wood. It goes back to the 19th century. It was originally a rope bed. We, the pegs are there for the ropes. It does have now a box spring and a mattress on it. It it got cozy at 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 times, and um, uh, and uh, but you know. Uh, we made it work. It's fortunate um, you were both good sleepers, is all I can say. Yes, and and as I say, we were fond of each other. But um, <laughs> it um, actually at our at a home, uh, we're fortunate enough to have a home on the beach in South Carolina, where we inherited when we bought this house a king size bed in in our bedroom, and Koki hated that bed. But you she get lost saying, in a king size bed. She said she kept saying, "You can't find each other. <laughs> You're too far away. You can't keep my feet warm at night." You know, if you're that far away on the, in the bed. So, and I, you know, I'm still in the bed, still in the room, still in the bed, still in the house. And, you know, we're creatures of habit. So I should get you to tell the story of how Koki came to work at NPR because she was one of the three or four founding mothers. And um, we all came at different times. Uh, Linda and Susan actually were there uh, at the beginning, I came shortly after, mm, three, four years after that, and then Koki, but I'll get you to tell the story. Well, um, people don't realize that uh, Koki, given the enormous eminence and success of her career, the first time she was a full-time working journalist, staff journalist, she was 34 years old. Um, and as I mentioned to Lori earlier, when we got married, 1966, it was just naturally assumed that my job was more important. I was working for the New York Times and we moved four times from my job. We moved to New York, then to Los Angeles, then to Athens. And um, her first breakthrough on, on the radio actually came in Athens before she got to NPR. Um, she had been producing children's television shows in, in, in Los Angeles. Obviously she couldn't do that in Greece. So we hit on this idea that maybe she could do some work for one of the networks, uh, TV networks. And so she connected with CBS and uh, they gave her a tape recorder. She was very, um, uh, she was very excited about getting this tape recorder because <laughs> it was sort of a sign that she was serious. And um, so about two months into our time in, in, in uh, Athens in the spring of 1974, um, uh, there is a coup, uh, she, she cables CBS and says, okay, I'm ready to do some work for you. No more than a day or two later, there was a coup in Cyprus, which is part of my territory. Right-wing generals had deposed the left-wing government. And so all the reporters from that part of the world flocked to Cyprus. Then two days later, the Turks invade Cyprus to try to overturn the coup. Koki is one of the only English language reporters in Athens, because everybody else was in Cyprus. And she gets a cable from CBS that says, the Turks have invaded Cyprus. Can you file a radio spot in 30 minutes? 
Now think about this. This woman who became, as you said, a founding mother of NPR had never done a radio report in her life at that moment. She goes down to the Reuters office where I work. She cobbles together a report. She gets it to CBS. Two days later, the Greek government falls, the military government falls as a result of all of this turmoil in that part of the world. Again, that's the biggest story in the world that night. I mean, Greece is a NATO country. Just look on the map, see how important it is geopolitically. And she was the only reporter there. And she manages to get a radio report out that night. And her mother gets a phone call that night from CBS and says, do you have a picture of, her do of your daughter? And her mother, Lindy, is appalled. What's wrong? What's wrong? No, 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 Mrs. Fox, it's OK. But the only story we have out of Athens tonight is Koki's radio report. And it's going to lead the Cronkite show tonight. But while we play the audio, we want to put our picture up. So that was pretty much of a breakthrough. And for the next week, she's on the air continuously covering this story. I'm still in Cyprus. I have no idea any of this is happening. I finally get out a week later. I walk through the door of our house in Athens and I find I'm married to a veteran foreign correspondent. <laughs> but, Not only that, she enlisted your son. Yes, this is true. <laughs> our son, who was five at the time, um, and she was very busy. So he was kind of unsupervised <laughs> for a while. And he wandered up to um, the main street of, uh, uh, that goes north out of Athens. We lived not far from the Greek Pentagon. And there was a movement of tanks through the streets. And country where democracy was very fragile, movement of a dozen tanks was pretty significant political story. So our son comes back and says, mommy, I counted 12 tanks going up the street. Koki goes on the air for CBS saying, According to reliable sources here in Athens, there's been a major troop movement. <laughs> Years later, people said, Koki, how could you trust it? She said, the kid could count. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I could trust it. But we come back to, to Washington and still she had never been, she still was not a full-time, this was all a part-time job. And she was very unhappy about coming back to Washington for a lot of reasons. Uh, but I came back, we came back again for my job. I wanted a, I had dreamed of rejoining the Washington Bureau of the New York Times where I had started 11 years before. And so on my first morning in the New York Times Bureau, I look around, I'm given a desk, I look around and there's a young woman I don't recognize. I introduce myself, she says her name is Judy Miller. And I said, well, where did you used to work? And she says, National Public Radio. And I said, what's that? <laughs> because it had been in existence for six years, but for four of those years, we had been in Europe, so I didn't know. She starts explaining this to me. And I said, wait, that sounds like the perfect place for my wife to work. She's crying herself to sleep every night in Bethesda. She doesn't want to be home. She's scared of the workforce. What do I do? And Judy says, call my friend, Nina Totenberg. And so I called you and you said, I know who you are. I heard of you. Um, get me Koki's resume tomorrow. And so I walked out the door of the New York Times Bureau the next morning and delivered Koki's resume to you. You met me. We have a different memory. I think it was on a street corner. You think it was in the lobby of NPR. But basically, what was so significant uh, about that moment, not just in terms of Koki's career, but in terms of women in journalism, because this is the first time, Nina, when I saw you able to take this resume, this was the old girls network at work. This was the first time I had ever seen women in a position to do for each other what men had always done for each other. And, you know, um, the, the, the second half of the story is yours. And you went upstairs and you helped push Koki's resume through the bureaucracy and she got hired, but-, but And Linda knew cool. her, didn't know her well, but she knew her from Wellesley. Yeah. So we were just pounding on the table. I mean, you have to understand NPR, we were all young, and including NPR, very young. It wasn't really crazy to say, what's that? Not that many people knew at that moment. And, um, and, and this was nobody, no man would have worked for the salary. Let's, let's get real here. That's why they had so many women working there. So this was sort of the beginning in professional terms, I really do think um, of the old girls network. Absolutely, without a question. And you know, I worked three blocks away at the New York Times. The New York Times had had straight white male White House correspondents for a hundred years. 
th there were these encrusted stereotypes and prejudices and, and ways of doing things and models that, that people didn't even know how powerful they were. They didn't even recognize them. And three blocks away at NPR, there were all of these young women taking these roles. And it was, such a, it was such a different culture. It might have been because of the pay, but the result was that the culture was so different. The, the models were so different and it, and it perpetuated itself because young women then saw you and Susan and Linda and Toki uh, and, and, and they wanted to be like you and they wanted to work for NPR. And so you were able then to, to, to continue to recruit outstanding women and, and train them and, and promote them in ways that the more encrusted traditional organizations just eventually they sort of came around, but they were never the equal of NPR in terms of the way women played such a prominent role. You know, what was it like for you when you got um, the resume? What did you well, think when you I mean, I didn't, I, I, at least Linda knew Koki or, or Koki Boggs as she remembered her. I didn't know Koki. But I knew, I looked at this resume and I thought, you know, let's get her in here. She seems, she knows what she's doing. Um, let's do that. And it was a, you know, it was a, it's a, it was a very important moment for lots of reasons because she and I sat facing each other. There was no, literally uh, two feet from each other, looking at each other. So I would listen to her talking to her children sometimes while she's filing <laughs> or um and we would talk about things that well frankly men didn't talk about and <laughs> and it was a for, for all of those reasons it was very important and we had a horrible old couch in the corner where linda and koki and i were and whenever some young woman because everybody we were all young men um, would be in trouble over something, they would come down, come over and sit on the couch and hash it out with us if we had time, otherwise they'd have to wait a while. Or sometimes one, I remember, um, we also managed to fix up uh, Steve's brother because we figured out that this would be a very good match with one of our ace producers, Kitty Ferguson. And I remember when Kitty was pregnant with twins, she would come and lie on that couch. It was the only place she could go and not be seen lying down when she didn't want anybody to see. Well, and, and the the epithet, uh, Laurie, for that uh, corner of the room was they, I don't know whether the men just created it. was the But it was, um, it was known as the fallopian jungle uh, was the, uh, uh, was that corner. But, you know, um, once Kogi got to NPR, um, uh, it there was it was an impact on our lives and an impact in the larger world. On our own lives, um, uh, there was a moment not long after she got there and she started working, and uh, there was this uh, a meltdown at the nuclear power plant at Three Mile Island in the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania. Kogi got to off the the office early that morning, and they said, "Go to." Three Mile Island, and she was thrilled. I mean, she wanted a, a good assignment, so she, she packs up and leaves. And two hours later, I get to the New York Times Bureau, and they said, go to Three Mile Island. And I said, no, because we have two children at home, and they're both, you know, it's dangerous. We don't know what's going to happen. We can't both be there. That was the first time, not the last, but the first time that her job took precedence over mine. It's a very clear moment in my mind, how these trajectories started crossing. And, um, and then uh, we wound up covering the same um, stories for years. We covered the same beat for NPR for many years. I mean, she was at NPR, I was at the New York Times. We, we were both the congressional correspondents and, and we did that for, um, for many years. And um, uh, Koki's, um, and, and the contribution she made as a congressional correspondent, um, was enormous because it wasn't just what Nina was talking about, the, the, the modeling that these women um, provided for other young women. They, they came at their jobs from a different perspective. They had different experiences. They had different uh, values. And what sums it up is a story I tell in the book. When Koki was working for NPR and covering the Hill, there was a big budget meeting over some long forgotten budget battle, but to the men, the big issue was 
a certain missile, the MX missile, was the MX missile still in the budget? The congressmen come out of their negotiating session and all these men are jumping up and down and say, is the MX missile in the budget? Is the MX missile in the budget? And Koki looks at everybody and says, is funding for mammograms in the budget? And that story sums up the, the difference it made to have not just Koki, but Nina and Linda and a whole generation of women looking at the world from a different perspective. And when Kogi then goes to work for ABC and um, she never lost her focus. She never lost her sense of priorities. There's a wonderful story. The guy, the uh, producer who was there the first morning, Kogi got tried out for, NBC, uh, for ABC, right? And this was a big deal. I mean, she'd been tried out for a network position. It was one Sunday, it was a one-off, one, one Sunday audition. And this guy tells me the story that Koki marches in and says to him, Mark, there are three things you need to know about me. I've been married to the same man for 20 years. I live in the house I grew up in and I go to church every Sunday. And if you understand that about me, we're going to be fine. And Mark said, look, over the, all those years, I knew the both of you, Steve, the only thing that changed was the number of years in <laughs> number of years you were married. But um, it was... Um, she, she never lost her perspective. She knew what was important. She knew what her value system was. But when she went on TV, um, it was true at NPR, but then it gets amplified as she goes on TV. And, and yes, there are a lot of men who thought she was smart and sexy. I know that. But the core of her rooting section, the core of what made her so important were the women who listened to her. And I remember in doing the research for the book, I talked to one woman producer who said, when Koki started doing ABC, I would, I would talk to my women friends and they would say, you know, I'm watching ABC now because I want to watch Koki because Koki asks the questions I would ask. Koki makes the comments I would make. Koki has lived the life I've lived. And so there was this, it wasn't just the model of her seeing on TV. It was much more than that. It was asking about mammograms, yes, but it was also asking about countless other things and, 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 and bringing the perspective of a woman to this arena that had been lacking in a male-dominated world. And that really was a very important part of what, uh, what her contribution was, I think. Also, she was so willing to ask the impolitic question, but to ask it very directly, but charmingly. And I think can think of no time that was more apparent than when she really held um, the feet to the fire of some of the Catholic clergy at the time that the scandal about, about uh, molesting children was beginning to come to the fore. And she simply wasn't having any of it. She wasn't going to not, you know, they were going off to some big conference and, or it was a, you know, choosing a new Pope. And she wasn't going to let those questions go unasked. And what I always admired so much about her was that she was tough, but she didn't look tough. <laughs> um, and, you know, she, uh, and part of what, I write about this in the book, there was a real struggle about how she looked on TV because uh, New York wanted her to be more glamorous. And she was naturally so beautiful that she really didn't need much help. Mm -hmm. And but, she, but beyond that, she understood why people listen to her. And she said, they want, what they want from me is common sense. And so she said, I have to basically look the way I sound. <laughs> I have to look sensible as well as sounding sensible. And if they allow them to put all this makeup on me and fan, you know, change my wardrobe, it's gonna be out of sync. It's not gonna be consistent with who I am. And, um, but you're right about the clergy. And you know, it was very difficult for her. You know, Laurie, when you talk about the children's inn, right up the road, literally from you know, two minutes from the children's inn is Sacred Heart School, Stone Ridge, which, right across uh, Wisconsin Avenue, which was her school from the time she started as kindergarten to the graduated from high school. And um, she was deeply devoted to the nuns and deeply devoted to the church, but she 
you got to remember this was one of the reasons she was so devoted to Stone Ridge was because this was a Catholic institution run by and for women. And it wasn't run by priests and it wasn't run by the Catholic hierarchy. And she felt this was an island, an oasis, almost a refuge for a devout Catholic woman in an institution that consigned women to second class status, but not in that school. <coughs> and she used to say with some bitterness, you know, the nuns, the nuns told us we could grow up to be anything we wanted, except priests. <laughs> and she, not pleased by that. But, you know, she, contained, she continued to be very devout. She said, it's my church. I have my own personal relationship to my God and to Jesus, and I'm not going to let those men uh, shake me. And, and she was once asked, uh, what's your favorite Sunday morning news program? And without a blink, she said, mass. <laughs> and, uh, and she was asked, what would you change in the Catholic Church? She said, I'd ordain women. And she always said that. And she was deeply devoted to nuns. And, and they she died. She, some of her best friends. And if a nun asked her to do anything, she did it, possibly. There's a wonderful story in the book. There's a woman named Joan Magnetti, Sister Joan, who still today runs a school, a Catholic girls' school in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And Joni, as Koki always referred to her, Joni calls her once and says, Koki, I really need a really big favor. Mother Teresa has promised to give our graduation speech but I'm told she's notoriously unreliable and I need you to put the date on your calendar in case you have to pinch hair. Cookie said, of course, Joni, whatever you need. Of course, Mother Teresa, two weeks before, cancels. And so as Joan tells me the story, Cookie didn't tell me the story, Joan did. The girls are all on the lawn. It's a beautiful spring day in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The girls are on the lawn and the graduates in their chairs and all the parents and everybody. And Cookie walks out of the main building and she's wearing as Joan describes, a bright orange yellow dress with a big hat and looking gorgeous. And she throws her arms out and says, clearly, I am not Mother Teresa. <laughs> um, but she, you're quite right in pointing out that uh, this was a lifelong struggle for her. And she never flinched from to asking tough questions, not just of male priests, but of men in any position of authority. Uh, one of her most famous moments on ABC, there was a man named Donald Kendall. He was Bill Clinton's lawyer. And he came during the Monica Lewinsky stuff, he came on the Sunday show and tried to make the argument, you know, that oral sex was not really sex. And, you know, the president had not lied when he said, I did not have sex with that woman, you know, Miss Lewinsky. And Koki looks at him and says, Mr. Kendall, do you think your wife would agree with your definition? <laughs> and he was so undone by this. Sam Donaldson told me the story. He was so undone and so furious that he got up from his chair and stumbled into a lamp that was on the set and knocked it over because he was so, so disconcerted. But Koki was not going to let him get away. So she, any man, including, as I've made clear, her husband, she never let men get away with that kind of pomposity. So you shared a number of stories together and can you tell about any of those situations and when you're both reporting on the same event and what that was like? Well, uh, I'll tell one, you know, uh, we did do a lot of reporting together. You're right. We also wrote two books together and we wrote over a thousand newspaper columns together. Uh, so we, did, we loved uh, cooperating together, and, and, but she always got on the air first. I mean, you know, when she was at NPR in particular, right? She got on at six o'clock at night. In those days, you had to wait till six o'clock in the morning to get the New York Times. So I could never compete with her. She always <laughs> um, but um, uh, there, was a, uh, <laughs> there was one funny incident. It was, and we, we both tried, we covered campaigns that could be difficult, you know, and some, sometimes we would travel together and cover the same story. Sometimes we had to separate and, and, and this was the, um, the election. It was one, it was early in 1980. So uh, it would have been 84, I think. And so our daughter was born in 1970. So she would have been a freshman in high school, right? And in the week before the election, 
I'm covering the story in Chicago for the New York Times and she's in Los Angeles for NPR. And we call home and we, to find that our daughter has gone to the senior prom at Walt Whitman High School where she was a freshman. Koki is beside herself. She's so upset. She said, you know, I mean, I'm missing my, my daughter's first prom. And, and she was just so upset. And she says to our son, who's two years older, who's delivering this news, because Becca's already gone off. And uh, she said, well, what was she wearing? And, and Lisa says, well, something blue of yours, mom. <laughs> something blue and shiny of yours, mom. And, um, and Koki and I are on the phone all night talking to each other. And then we realize, well, we can't, we're both on the phone, so if Becca comes home, we, she can't get through to either one of us. So we agree to hang up the phone. We're both stewing over this, continent apart, half a continent apart. And she's the last one home. You know, she finally gets home at two o'clock in the morning, whatever. And, uh. <laughs> and, 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 and she said, well, because my parents weren't home, I was the last one to get dropped off because they would, you know. Um, but we tried as hard as we could to, uh, uh, to, uh, travel together when we could because we really enjoyed covering the same the same stories but um there were, were times when you know when we had to be a part like that but one of my favorite stories about Koki and she was still at NPR and um she tried as Nina knows because Nina heard her talk to the, our kids constantly you know on the phone um she tried as hard as she possibly could with a lot of success to make every event that she possibly could and this was, Becca was in the sixth grade, our younger child in the sixth grade. And Koki, a few weeks before Halloween, had gone to her school. Folks from this area, familiar with the schools, in Radnor Elementary um, on Radnor Road, right near where we live. And so uh, it was, uh, she went for, you know, parents um, career day and she brought her tape recorders and her, all of her, um, her uh, credentials to tell the, the kids in the class what it was like to be a radio reporter, you know? And uh, so a couple of weeks later, it's Halloween. And Koki goes tearing out from the hill, all the way out to the suburbs, you know, in the middle of the workday, in the middle of it, she never should have done it, but she was not gonna miss because the sixth grade kids, all the kids in the elementary school in that era would parade through the neighborhood in their costumes. And Becca was the sixth grade, it was her last year she was gonna do this. Koki was not going to miss this. So she goes tearing out, out here to the school. And Becca's horrified, you know, that her mother is there. You know, mom, why are you here? I didn't ask you to be here. Koki said, I know you, I didn't do it for you. I did it for me. It's your last year. I'm going to be here. And then she looks up. And there are all of these sixth grade girls dressed in blue suits, carrying tape recorders. <laughs> All the girls had dressed up as Cokie Roberts for Halloween. Such a great story. It really is a great story. And uh, that was about the private Cokie and the public Cokie. That story is about both, right? She was there not as a celebrity, she was there as a mother. But her influence had radiated, her model had radiated. No, there was one particular quote in the book. Uh, from you that resonated with all of us here at the end. You noted that Koki was always the voice of people with less power and the voice of what's right. Any well, other stories that you'd like to share? That well, you know, she, uh, part of that um, in her reporting, but it was also very much a part of why she wrote the books she did, Lori, because she felt very strongly that um, it was essential that the roles that women had always played in American history uh, be resurrected and be revived and be celebrated. And as she said many times that, um, you know, the men uh, uh, held office and, and history has been told through the, the eyes of official history. And one of the reasons she was so sensitive to this enormous uh, role uh, that women had played throughout history, was she saw it in front of her because her own mother had been, her father Her father was a member of Congress for 30 years and her mother 
was his chief advisor, his chief strategist, his chief campaign manager. She saw in her own life that her mother was a modern version of Abigail Adams and a modern version of Dolly Madison. And so were all of her mother's friends, Lady Bird Johnson, Pauline Gore, Betty Ford, and including women, women who were also important in the founding and, and the building up of, of uh, Children's Inn, right? And, and so um, she saw the importance that these women had always played, but they were behind the scenes. But so she was determined to revive these stories. And there's, some, there's a wonderful story in the book, of course, by the accident of history, her father gets killed in a plane crash, 1972. And her mother decides to run for his seat and step from backstage to center stage as instead of being just the advisor, being the member of Congress. She calls her lifelong friend, Lady Bird Johnson, to say, Bird, I, I want you to know before you read about the papers that I've decided to run for Hale's seat. Mrs. Johnson says, why, well, Lindy, darling, that's a wonderful idea. But how are you going to do it without a wife? <laughs> And um, but she um, and she always said that the that the letters that women had written, she said, you know, the men, they they knew they were writing for history. Right. She said they the, the letters read as if they were written by those marble statues <laughs> in those bronze statues, pompous and self-important and, and, and very carefully considered. The women were writing for each other. And, and, and there was this incredible trove of insight into the life and, and liveliness of these times that had been buried in, in, the, in these women's letters and diaries. And so she tapped into this wonderfully vibrant um, dimension of history. Uh, and one of the, as I say, one of the main reasons that, that she was so committed to this, and I, I said to her many times, you know, you have a mission here, Kofi. You know, writing books is hard. Nina's writing one now. I just finished writing one. It is really hard work. And you can't do it unless you're really committed to it. But she was committed because she was committed to these stories. She was committed to these women. She was committed to, to um, in this whole dimension of her life, um, uh, celebrating the contributions women had always made but had never been really recognized. And, and there, we should say one other thing about her. She really was, she, it's very trite to say that she loved children and she was a sucker, triple sucker for babies, but she adored children. And that was one of the ways that she connected with people, even the week that she died. And Steve tells us her, I think, in the book. I don't know if it's the book and it's not in the book at this point. It is but, in the book, yeah. yeah. Oh, so you tell the story. Well, uh, you know, Laurie, you, you talked about the contributions she made to the end, and you showed that montage of her with children. And Nina's absolutely right about this. This was, she loved children, and she was at the bedside, and the, she was the first person in every maternity ward in, in, in Washington. She had one friend who tells the story how Koki was there within an hour after this, child, this woman had a baby, and Koki tears into the maternity ward, says, Where's that child? Where's that baby? And scoops her up. And um, uh, and starts making a sign of the cross on her forehead, and her young friend says, "Koki, you know that's a Jewish baby, don't you?" And Koki says, "Of course, Alan, I know it's a Jewish baby, but I'm just covering our bases. I just, you know, you don't mind if I baptize." <laughs> but um, the story that that Nina is referring to, uh, when she was this is she was dying uh, at at NIH, and. Um, um, we didn't know she was dying, but she was. Very, we knew she was very sick. And there was a nurse that um, was pregnant, but also had two small children at home. And Koki had been uh, bugging this woman, Judith. I want to see pictures of, that, of those children, Judith. And, and that's what she did with everybody. All of our women friends, maybe you ran into this, Laurie, yourself. You know, she would ask after children, she would know everything about when kids went to school, when they went to camp. And she, people could not figure out how she kept this all in her head. But this is the first thing, whenever she met one of her women friends, it was one of the first things she said, right? Anyway, she's bugging, she's bugging Judith. 
and it's six o'clock at night. Judas is about to go off her shift. And she says, okay, finally, okay, Koki. And she goes over and shows Judas these pictures of these gorgeous children. Was, they'd been at a wedding or something. So these pictures, they were all dressed up. And, and through the pain and difficulty Koki was going through, this incandescent smile of hers just breaks through. It's like sun coming through the clouds. And she just says, Judas, what beautiful children. And she opens her arms and the two of them embrace. And it's one of my last memories of Koki because I left the hospital room a few minutes later. And um, early the next morning, she had an attack that left her unresponsive. And it was the last time I ever saw her conscious. She lived for three more days, but the last time I ever saw her conscious was at that moment, Opening her arms, opening her arms, opening her arms to this woman and, 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 and making this woman feel good about herself and about her children. And that, again, Lori, that's the private cookie. That has nothing to do with being a TV star. That has to do with these elemental human impulses of generosity of spirit. And as I've said, I, I really do think that's the most important lesson in the book. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. I'm sure her arms were just open for both of you. You talked about all the things she was committed to. She was so committed to both of you and her family. Especially the children's in. And the children's in. Well, we're at the hour, so I just have to pull this together for now, although I would love to be able to keep going on. There's so many stories of bring Koki to life, which you so beautifully have done. Um, thank you for such memorable conversation about Koki. At the end, Koki was close to our families. As you said, she asked about specifics about each person. Where are you from? Tell us about your family. Um, and you know, at board meetings, she was right to the point. She was abundance of common sense. We would process and process and she would just get to the point, just do it. <laughs> so it was like, what would Koki do? Um, so thank you for sharing all of that. If you'd like to purchase Koki, A Life Well Lived by Steve Roberts, please go to Politics and Prose and use the code SPECIAL10 to receive 10% off. Part of the proceeds will go to the end. Thank you. To our committed supporters, we want to remind you that the Children's Inn at NIH is hosting two events this winter. On February 17th, from 1 to 3, we'll, we invite you to a virtual discussion on health disparities, how pediatric clinical trials can promote health equity. And on Saturday, February 26th, at 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., hope that this is in person, snowed in once again, this time at the Lone Star Brewery. More information will be available on our digital platforms. So to everyone who's here um, that came to be able to listen, thank you for taking part of this program. From our family to yours, we wish you a healthy, happy, meaningful, and hopeful new year. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Nina. Thank you all. Thank you, Lori. Mm -hmm.